like we're just after three o'clock. I want to welcome you today to Encore Learning Presents, a conversation with George Mason University's Dr. Bonnie Stabil. And um, Bonnie's going to talk today about her new book, Women, Power, and Rape Culture. And we'll do a little bit more of an intro in a moment. Before we get started, I want to let you know about some other upcoming events that Encore Learning's offering uh, coming up on Monday, November 14th at three o'clock. Uh, Dan Sherman, a popular instructor, is going to present a program about Casablanca, the movie, and the backstory. And then on Monday, December 12th, we have Dr. Monica Nagoy uh, talking about the mathematics of beauty and the beauty of mathematics. So those should be great programs. Again, on Mondays at three o'clock uh, coming up. And um, we always use the same Zoom ID. So just remember this Zoom ID and you'll be able to connect. So I'm pleased today to have Dr. Bonnie Stabile here with us to talk about women power in the politics of rape um, and, and rape culture, sorry rape culture. Uh, Bonnie is the Associate Professor and Associate Dean of Students and Academic Affairs at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. She's also the Director of the Master of Public Administration, the MPA program, and also served for five years as a Director of Public Policy program, the MPP program. Um, Dr. Stabile is the Director of the Gender and Policy Center at the Shar School, and um, we're just uh, she actually just works a couple floors down from us here at, from our office that Encore, Encore Learning has at George Mason University at, at the Van Meter Hall. So nice to see my neighbor here today. And um, she's going to provide a talk about her book, and then we'll, we'll answer some questions and engage the audience. So thank you so much, Bonnie, for joining us. All right. Thanks so much, Laura, for having me. And thanks to, all, to you for being here. Um, and so I'm very pleased to talk about my book. And uh, this is the first time I'm doing a book talk. So I'm glad to be doing it with all of you. Um, so the the first slide, I guess, that we're going to talk about is how did we get here with this book title, right? Um, Women, Power, and Rape Culture, the Politics and Policy of Underrepresentation. Um, in the acknowledgement section of my book, I say, you know, I didn't really want to have a title with rape culture in the title, but it seemed to become necessary to me. And in the course of this discussion, I will be explaining why that is. But about the time that I was inspired to write this book, I had been studying the issue of campus sexual assault uh, for some time. And um, so I, you know, I kind of had my head in that space and understanding that problem problem from a policy perspective. So because I'm a professor of public policy, I'm really interested in policy mechanisms, you know, mechanisms that are legal and written in, you know, in policies and laws that deal with problems that confront us in the public sphere. And uh, the whole founding sentiment of my center on gender and policy um, at the Shar School uh, we call it the Gap Center, We Mind the Gap is our tagline, is the idea that there are big disparities that occur um, in outcomes of public policies that we think correspond with disparities in representation of women in positions of power in the public sphere. So to the degree that women are underrepresented um, in the legislature, in uh, executive positions and appointed positions um, in the C-suite, so to speak, in the corporate world. Um, we also see disparities in outcomes for women, and that is a big, uh, a big interest, a point of interest for me. So I wanted to look at uh, the politics and policies, and uh, the precipitating event that you see here, you might recognize as the Women's March from January 21st of 2017. And so the election of Donald Trump to the White House, um, to the presidency, you know, the highest office in the land and arguably the most powerful position in the, in the world, um, there was a lot of backlash from women uh, in part due to the disparaging tones and uh, terminology with which uh, Trump talked about women over the course of his career, and specifically in the run-up to the um, to the election during the campaign cycle. And of course, you may remember in October of 2016, those Access Hollywood tapes came out in which he talked about um, 
sexual assault really um, of women um, and very sort of, I mean, that was an old tape. Uh, it was not um, something that, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't something he said specifically during the election cycle, but he did make a lot of disparaging remarks. Um, so I guess we can go back still to the previous slide, just to, because I still want to emphasize just the the pink pussy hats, right? Because referencing his grab them by the pussy uh, statement that he made and was very unapologetic about it. Well, in the course of that, numerous women came forward to accuse, um, uh, accuse Trump of sexual harassment and assault over the course of his career. And um, so this was the sort of outpouring uh, from women. And you, of course, may remember these hats. And, you know, so this is the picture that we're left with. So I guess now we're ready to see the next slide, which is, um, so this is kind of um, not just something that is attributable to Trump, right? There's this narrative or this historical um, case of men who are uh, in positions of power in the public sphere, who are accused by numerous women and yet seem to be um, not held accountable. So as Trump said during the election cycle, he said, I could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and, you know, nobody would mind. All my supporters would still support me. Um, and well, that he never did that, but he was accused of sexual harassment um, and assault by numerous women pictured, uh, you know, some of whom are pictured here. And um, he also spoke disparagingly about women likening them to animals, um, rating them numerically, um, and, and we'll talk about uh, some specific terminology that he used, which was just considered so offensive by many. And some of the things that Trump said, and this is kind of how I think about it, that this was an inflection point during which what some characterized as Trump's, you know, straightforwardness, um, he could say anything, he would say anything, right? And so I see it as him making the unspeakable spoken, right? Previously, people didn't speak about these things. Um, and I think in response to that, women came out and said, you know, if, if he can talk like that, we can talk about these things that we haven't talked about. So many women have experienced sexual harassment and assault. Uh, most of the statistics that we see um, are around the order of one in four women have experienced sexual assault, um, larger numbers for harassment, of course. Um, but all of a sudden, these, these issues that women had kept um, to themselves out of shame and fear uh, they were going to speak the unspeakable. So that's one kind of way I, I think about it. Now, of course, this New York magazine cover is a, is the accusers of Bill Cosby, and that's actually from 2015. So this isn't all on Trump, right? This is kind of a sign of the times, you know. Uh, for some reason, things were coming to, to this point where there was this Me Too moment, and the Me Too movement, as we know, it actually started in 2017, some would say in response to both the election of Trump, but also uh, Harvey Weinstein, the movie mogul, um, being accused by all these actresses. So I guess the point of this slide is really how, how much testimony of women is necessary to plausibly or to credibly accuse one powerful man. Um, you know, the, and many of these charges, uh, the other playbook that we see is that they're just dismissed. Well, these people, they're mistaken or they're seeking fame or they are seeking money or, you know, they or they don't really know what they're talking about. And um, I think that we saw a turning point here. I would say that perhaps, and this is something maybe we can talk about, we might be in a moment of backlash now. Um, but anyway, so this is um, the idea that there's this idea of testimonial injustice is a term that um, that uh, Kate Mann, the philosopher, brings in, up in her book called Down Girl. And it's the idea that um, those in power and specifically in general white men are considered more credible and, um, and competent than women are. And uh, that the, that's why we see outcomes some, um, such as this, where it takes all of these women <laughs> to even begin to be believed. So I guess we're ready for the next slide. So this idea of silence comes into play in the book, as you'll see in a minute. But um, in, in 2017, uh, Time Magazine actually named as person of the year a group of women that they deemed as the silence breakers. So the women who came forward to talk about sexual harassment and sexual assault um, with regard to Trump, to Weinstein, and to a spate of other 
um, powerful men, legislators um, of, of both parties. Um, and, you know, this movement to uh, acknowledge the harm that has, is done to women, not just personally uh, by being on the receiving end of assault um, or harassment, but also professionally um, and, and for us as a society, because women are underrepresented and uh, it's the thesis of this book that one of the systemic causes of that underrepresentation is the fact that women have to live with this omnipresent threat of harassment and assault and the inability to speak fully back to it um, because they will then be disparaged or discredited um, you know, or uh, defamed in some way. So this movement is an uh, attempt to right that wrong for people as individuals. And because I study policy, I'm interested about um, what, what does that do for us systemically for society? And hopefully by removing a costly barrier to women's advancement, uh, we could see more women in positions of power. And then all these things are, or, you know, in a virtuous or a vicious cycle, right? Um, that when we have more women or people of color who are at the table and who are making decisions for organizations or for, um, you know, uh, communities, that, that their point of view is represented, that when we don't have good, um, broad representation uh, from women, from people of color, from people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, we lose our ability to see around corners. And, and outcomes for everybody are less good, right? So you'll see studies that say that uh, corporate boards and um, and C-suites that have more uh, broad representation actually do better. Their bottom line is better. And if you think about this um, idea that competition creates uh, competition and representation create the best outcomes, um, you know, it kind of it makes sense, right? So uh, anyway, so that's what the the silence breakers and um, the silencing of women historically and the attempt to ameliorate that for the purposes of better representation and more just outcomes in the public sphere are kind of the overarching theme that we're addressing here. So I guess we're ready for the next slide. So this is the table of contents of the book. And what I try to address in the book, again, being from a policy mindset, that there are three branches of government and that um, these are the three main avenues <clears throat> where power is exercised. I use the term power a lot um, because I think that's what it is. We should acknowledge it as such. Um, but these three branches of government, the executive, uh, legislative, and judicial, um, you know, that's where all the laws and policies get made. Um, and the outcomes we observe um, advancing the agenda of certain individuals or groups over others takes place. Um, as I said, I started studying the issue of campus sexual assault, and it struck me when I was studying that issue that in the campus context, uh, you would see this sort of narrative play out or this typical storyline play out where um, uh, an undergraduate male would um, be accused of rape or assault of, of a female student and um, would really not ever be held to account. So I can tell you some data there that talks about, you know, about one in four young women experiences um, some form of sexual assault um, or harassment as an, as an undergraduate student, um, that only a, a very small minority of those people report and then of those reported instances, only a very small percentage um, of, of the accused are held accountable. So you can imagine women know that if you come forward, you will be um, denigrated and that this will be hard to overcome at, reputationally. So uh, I'd like to talk about the philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who's uh, you know really one of the great public intellectuals uh, of our time. Um, she wrote a book called Sex and Social Justice that I use in my class. She also has written about shame and disgust in the law and how that shapes outcomes there. Um, so she's really 
a, if not the preeminent thinker in this field. But during the Me Too movement, she wrote an op-ed in one of the Chicago papers and said that she didn't recommend that women come forward as individuals because the costs to them were just too high. And hearing that was actually really heartbreaking for me because, you know, Martha, you know, Martha Nussbaum has said this, how could it be, right? But she's just acknowledging the costs that um, individuals would have to bear. And, um, you know, this is what this movement is about changing. And this is the thing I'm trying to bring to light. How are legal institutions actually perpetuate these problems and how they could better address them for more just outcomes? Um, so that's why I start, that's what started me thinking down this path when I saw the, uh, I was studying the policies of the Obama administration at the time. So we're going to look at sort of one rule or policy in each category that will um, help us understand what's been done, um, how, how much it's mitigated the problem, to what extent it's oftentimes inadequate, um, and how it leads to the results that we've seen of women being underrepresented and, and there being this bit of injustice there. So in the commander in chief in the bully pulpit, we do an analysis of um, Trump's tweets, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in the campus context, we talk about how, um, a rule that um, from the Department of Education, uh, part of Title IX, how it's interpreted through a dear colleague letter, uh, and um, you know how that leads to the outcomes that we observe. Um, then I'm going to look at um, the Supreme Court uh, nomination processes for both. Um, uh, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Thomas, one of whom was accused of sexual harassment, one of whom was accused of sexual assault, and um, look at how their status um, as such, as the accused, um, comports with the types of decisions they made on the bench. So it's mostly about Thomas because Kavanaugh has a not a very long record um, at the time of this writing. And then we look at uh, the congressional context and uh, some of the things that have played out there as far as the Congressional Accountability Act and how that is used to keep um, law, has been used to advance us a little bit more towards justice. So I guess we're ready for the next slide. So the, the idea here is that we know there's an abundance of evidence that disparities exist where race and gender are concerned in the outcomes for people in the public sphere with regard to proneness to violence, um, fairness in treatment by, by the legal system, um, access to education, um, health care, uh, and, and many other things. And this is counter to uh, what is expressed uh, as the principles of justice and fairness and equality, not only in our constitution, but many of the ethical codes that guide our public service, which are things that I teach about and talk about with my students and um, think about in the course of my research. So um, this was a meme, this picture I just found to encapsulate this, the George Floyd um, uh, murder and um, the Me Too movement uh, were very close historically um, and represent something of a similar thing, which is this rising up to address injustice um, that has been, for which there has been an abundance of evidence over quite a bit of time, but about which people often did not speak publicly for fear of reprisal or out of frustration, knowing that, that they're, uh, um, they were unlikely to be heard. Um, and so this, I don't know if you remember the case of Brock Turner, but he was a swimmer at Stanford who was accused uh, of, um, he was actually found um, in the act of raping an unconscious woman at a, at a party at Stanford. Um, he was uh, discovered by two uh, cyclists who came and stopped stopped him and held him and, and the police came and everything. And the long story short is that he got six months of jail and only served three months. Um, and this is a very common story. It's a very common story in the outcome, but uncommon in that in this case, there was incontrovertible proof that he was the assailant. Um, oftentimes, more often, most often, women are just telling their stories and not believed. So... Um, so that's what we're interested in this for, really outcomes in the public sphere in addition to representation. So um, I guess we're ready for the next slide. So we want to know, when I talk about rape culture, what does that actually entail? And I do think it is a pervasive problem. I'm going to talk about some of the elements that scholars and um, advocates and activists have um, 
have defined as rape culture. And it involves this continuum of threats raising from verbal sexual harassment to unwanted touching to sexual assault or rape. Um, and in this culture, and I, I posit that we live in this culture, right, that, that there is actually a condoning of some degree of subjection of um, women to violence because we just inadequately respond um, and that they these accusations are often met with disbelief, denial, and certainly a lack of adequate response. Um, so part of rape culture as defined by scholars is the idea that women are expected to um, behave in accord with traditional gender roles. And when they aren't, they are often punished um, or have costs imposed on them uh, when they seek power. So in the case of women lawmakers, as we'll talk about in the um, when we look at the rhetorical analysis, um, you see how how women are spoken of in the press, for instance, is one example of this punishment. And another is women who come forward with accusations of assault are often, um, you know, kind of ruined. And, you know, if you want to look at it that way, right, um, uh, or or set or their interests are set back, right, their educational interests or their career interests are set back by their having brought forth charges. So two words, sexism and misogyny, often go with this. And Kate Mann, the philosopher who I mentioned earlier, she's written two books, one called um, Down Girl, and it's, uh, the, it's about the logic of misogyny, and the other is Entitled. And um, in these books, she explores these terms, but she says sexism is really just beliefs and ideas about these, these roles um, and how people uh, adhere to social norms or face reprisal. Um, and, but misogyny, she calls the law enforcement branch of sexism. And what she says is these are the rules, um, both social and political, that um, help keep these ideas about women's roles in, the, in, um, in their place, right? That we um, want some of the reasons that we're failing to overcome them. So sexism is about attitudes, but misogyny is about um, things that help perpetuate it through through policy or law or social convention. And it's the policy and law that is most of interest to me um, in, in this examination that I do in the book. So um, next slide, please. So this chapter, The Commander in Chief in the Bully Pulpit is about the power of language. And actually a couple of years ago during the pandemic, I was on a panel uh, that the Encore Learning folks put together about um, about the power of language. So that was actually a lot of fun. And I think there's still a video floating around about that. Um, so that was a great panel and I'm, I'm appreciative to uh, the Encore Learning folks for putting that together. So what I posit here is that the way women are spoken of in traditional and social media uh, serves to set back their aspirations for uh, political and other leadership. And Specifically, uh, in the book, we do an examination of Trump's tweets. So there's this thing called the Trump Twitter archive. There was a researcher who, uh, just for his own interest, uh, captured every single tweet that Trump ever um, ever tweeted <laughs> um, and put them in a searchable database, which was very uh, useful for my purposes because I had been working with someone at the engineering school to do a similar task. And I've done some, I had prior to this, pro this book project done some social media analysis around the areas of sexual um, or harassment and assault. But when we analyzed Trump's tweets, what we did was we, um, we kind of combed through all of them, honestly, and, um, and, picked out those that we thought were used um, in different categories that can be used to disparage women. So what I said, I would say is Trump was sort of an equal opportunity um, ins insulter. You know, he would insult anybody and everybody. Um, but um, what I'm positing here is that when those types of insults are hurled uh, repeatedly and vitriolically, and then repeated in the in the mainstream media, that they can be more damaging to those from historically underrepresented groups than they are even for those who are from uh, powerful backgrounds. So women are underrepresented, people of color. So there is research that shows that when we hear stereotypes or um, denigrating terms that comport with things that we sort of grew up with um, as far as racial and racial epithets or 
um, gender denigration um, that it, it, it's easier to adhere to, that a lot of people believe these things more readily, um, in part because of the history of our country and our culture with some of these terms. And some of the things have to do with things like, well, you know, women aren't good at certain things, such as running or throwing or math or driving or, you know, there's all these terms. And if you look at popular culture, there's lots of ways in which um, these terms um, get um, get discussed. So, but what, what we did was in our analysis, we collapsed them into a mnemonic device um, with the, with the, to make the word silent. So what, what we did was categorize the terms in ways that um, talked about women that we think led to their being silenced. And so these categories are stature and stamina, intelligence, looks, uh, emotional state, necessary qualifications, and trustworthiness. So for instance, um, Trump used the term crazy in his tweets over 300 times. Um, and most often there's one woman um, who was on the receiving end of this and um, and it was Nancy Pelosi, right? So he also used other words um, about her repeatedly. And this was part of Trump's playbook to uh, like a marketing executive, repeat, 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 you know, to call somebody crazy or stupid or dummy or dope. And you can see what some of these are, but he used the word angry, unhinged, having a meltdown, saying something's wrong with her upstairs um, uh, with Nancy Pelosi. Um, and the power of these tweets, um, given the number of followers that Trump had, I would say it was quite substantial, not only because of the platform of Twitter and how it was used, but also because the mainstream media, I don't know if you were ever noticed this, I did because I was researching it, right? But I'd be at breakfast watching the Today Show and they would put his tweets up on the screen, you know, as and talk about it. And mainstream media outlets would use his taglines from his tweets in their headlines. So, you know, when he he called um, Dana Nessel, the attorney general of Michigan, um, the wacky do nothing attorney general of Michigan um, numerous times. And that was kind of, he would put these out in a staccato. Um, in October, 2017, he called represented Representative Frederica Wilson, um, a Democrat from Florida who's African American, um, he called her wacky three times over the course of four days. But of course, the retweeting of this led to a much more substantial um, repetition. And then she, as a woman of color, um, I think serves to be even more tarnished by this disparagement than um, than others. But that's a discussion we can have. Um, these explosions of tweets denigrating women and others um, usually came after their, uh, after Trump, uh, after they criticized Trump, uh, like Dana Nessel criticized um, Trump for not wearing a mask during his tour of, uh, of a car plant when he was out there. Um, Frederica Wilson um, criticized Trump for um, when he spoke with a grieving widow of a service member who had been killed of, um, of, of just being disrespectful of her and um, saying, saying he was her guy and he should have known what he was getting himself into in the military. You know, and so when, when Representative Wilson brought that up, Trump hits back, that was, how, that was what he did by raising sort of not substantive kind of spurious things, but criticisms that really call people, you know, third-rate clown, ineffective. I mean, I'm just looking at some of these words in all these different categories. Um, now, he did also um, disparage men, of course. You may remember how he talked about Lil Marco Rubio and um, crying um, Chuck Schumer. And, you know, and, and some of those terms are actually gendered as well because they um, accuse men of being feminine, right, or crying or or being small, you know, some of the same types of disparaging terms are used there. So anyway, there's lots to talk about there, but this is the general thesis, how these things were used. So for instance, the crazy, the treat, the tweet, uh, one tweet where um, Trump called Pelosi crazy um, was retweeted um, over 1.4 million times. So this start, 
arguably starts to get in people's heads. I mean, and you could say, what's the difference or does it have any tangible outcomes? And there's no way to show the association definitively, but we do know that uh, just a couple of days ago, someone broke into Nancy Pelosi's house trying to kill her, uh, ostensibly for political motives, um, and who really kind of bought into these narratives of her being ineffective or evil or um, or the like, right? So, it, and uh, similarly, the governor of Michigan, um, about whom Trump tweeted um, relentlessly as well, uh, there was a kidnapping plot against her. So, uh, words do have power. Um, our advertisers can tell you that. So, um, I think that there is something there that's worth discussing when we think about how it impacts women's ability to lead um, and to access and hold positions of power. So, next slide, please. So in the chapter about the campus context, we interviewed the leaders of various campus organizations and here's their names and the organizations that they um, represent. This was a great group to, um, to have access to. And actually next week, um, I'm going to the National Women's Studies Association meeting with some of the uh, people that you see here, Nora Gallo, Lily James, um, uh, Kenyura Parham. Um, we're going to talk about the campus context and the laws and policies that are relevant here. I think it's interesting to point out that the, the women leading these organizations, um, most of them experienced sexual assault as a student and felt like they uh, were not heard and that they were mistreated and even re-traumatized by um, the legal and uh, campus uh, institutional system, and they wanted to mitigate that for other women, and uh, that's their story. So they each have very interesting stories, and you know it's really impressive that as young women um, experiencing this, uh, that they set about making a difference, changing uh, state laws and policies. So in the case of Every Voice Coalition, those are the youngest people that I interviewed while they were in while they were still in school. Uh, they started an initiative to have state level uh, policies passed to um, address campus sexual assault in ways that um, that make sure the victim gets uh, adequate response and to look at preventative measures. And they've actually uh, successfully passed laws, um, had, you know, had uh, that put on uh, as bills and got those laws passed in a handful of states, which is more than I ever accomplished as an undergraduate, and maybe even now. Um, and they're on a campaign to do this across the whole country. So each one of these organizations is super interesting uh, uh, in its own accord. But the sort of narrative there is this is another way by which women are speaking back against being silenced and trying to look at mechanisms of policy as a means to correcting the ills that they identified and from which they suffered. Um, so next slide, please. So in the um, judiciary, um, I, as I mentioned, I would focus on uh, Thomas and Kavanaugh. And um, we decided it would be good to show these pictures of these men who were very angry um, and arguably felt entitled to these positions um, and didn't like being um, called out by women, right? And and the women who called them out, you know, were accomplished, um, educated, and, you know, had revered positions in their own right, uh, but still were unable to buck the system, if you will. In each case, and it's something we talk about in the book, there are um, mechanisms along the way. So at the time, Joe Biden was uh, chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the time of the uh, Thomas Hill uh, testimony. And what he said was that he um, adhered to all the rules in giving Anita Hill a fair hearing. Uh, but what he didn't mention was that he made the rules and, the, um, and that those rules disallowed a handful of women who wanted to come forth and give testimony from speaking. And that was a conscious decision um, that definitely 
would have influenced the process. I don't know what the outcome would have been, of course, but, you know, and that's just one small example along the way. And here's a, this is an article um, that just says, you know, congrats to Brett Kavanaugh on getting to be angry. This is another thesis that we explore and a lot of literature explores that women really aren't allowed to express anger as freely as men are. The, the implications for their careers and their personal lives are much different because women are expected to sort of be nurturing and quiet and um, all of that, and that um, the implications for them uh, in expressing anger can um, not go well for them, shall we say. So, but, but Kavanaugh and Thomas both felt free to um, really angrily uh, object to the treatment to which they uh, were being subjected. Um, as you know, as one would on those circumstances, but again, how how are women reacting? How are men reacting? And what are the implications? So I guess we're ready for the next slide. So here we have, of course, um, Christine Blasey Ford and Anita Hill, and um, that photograph um, that you see is the panel of questioners that they faced in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And, um, you know, if you look at the homogeneity of that group, right, it really is predominantly white men who hold power there. I remember seeing the pictures of Anita Hill in that chambers where, you know, very few women who ever enter that chamber um, were there to do anything but bring somebody coffee or um, be a stenographer um, at the time of Anita Hill's hearing. And that is visually very obvious when you see the pictures. It was also... Um, notable that she's wearing this very bright colored suit and, you know, she's looking at a sea of gray, both suits and hair. Um, and the treatment to which she was subjected has been written about extensively elsewhere. I talk about it a little bit in the book. Um, but the, the way in which the power structure and the rules were stacked against her um, being believed is um, is something that we explore. And then, you know, decades later, Christine Blasey Ford had a similar experience. Um, both of them uh, did comport themselves very, um, you know, with a lot of composure. Uh, and, and I think that that's expected of women. And um, had they not, it may have been an even more difficult situation for them. Um, but what we try to look at is, so what are the implications of the process that enabled these charges to be raised about people who would sit on the court with lifetime appointments? And then more importantly, even what are the implications of such people serving? Um, so may we have the next slide, please? So we um, devised this model of uh, uh, the role of judges in women's underrepresentation, because again, that's our main concern here. And we kind of say, yeah, you know, sexual harassment happens regardless of which side of the aisle you're on. Um, so, or, or if you're conservative or liberal, I mean, nobody has the corner on the market of this. The, another thing I will say is just that um, most men are not rapists or, and, uh, or sexual harassers. And, and certainly in the case of rape and sexual assault, um, really, truly the minority of men actually engage in this behavior, but they tend to have a multiplicity of victims. So um, the people that engage in this behavior, um, it affects many people. And if you look at the, if you remember back to the slide where we had all the accusers of Trump um, and Cosby um, and Harvey Weinstein, you see that, you know, one individual uh, and all of the, all of the victims. Um, but anyway, we said that if there are conservative justices or liberal justices, either way, there are implications in that behavior. Um, if the behavior is perpetrated by um, someone who's conservative, not only is the harm individualized um, in the act of harassment or assault, but also those people will favor policies that constrain women's autonomy. So really women's autonomy is the big issue of interest to me. Um, do policies or laws advance or constrain women's autonomy? So to me, that is one of the most important measures by which we can judge policy outcomes. And um, so anyone who's liberal, if they perpetrate sexual harassment or assault, that will have individual implications, but to the extent that they may promote policies that nonetheless 
um, advance women's autonomy. Um, this is not in any way to say, oh, that's fine. I'm just trying to show that, you know, bad behavior yields bad outcomes. And here's where we think that um, how that looks. And one thing I will say is that um, this idea of testimonial injustice, um, the belief that women are less trustworthy and less and less competent than men sort of permeates this whole uh, discussion because they get less of a legal hearing. So legal and policy mechanisms that lim limit women's voices and constrain women's autonomy allow the continued perpetration of these offenses. Uh, people can act with um, impunity when they know there'll be no consequences for them. And I think a lot of women felt that in the election of Donald Trump, that he always showed us who he was, um, but he was always able to get away with it. And he was able to become, you know, the most, arguably the most powerful person in the world, even with having these offensive behaviors um, and the offensive rhetoric that he used. Um, so anyway, that, that the end result is uh, that there's an influence on women's representation um, in the public sphere, which is the variable of interest for us. And we wanted to think about, you know, does it matter? I obviously we think it does matter who's making those laws and policies based on their own beliefs and their life experience. Um, next slide, please. So this is too small to read, but basically we looked at 10 sexual harassment, um, harassment or sexual harassment Supreme Court cases that had a Thomas vote between 1992 and 2020, and um, which is basically spanning the period of, from when he joined the court to when we wrote the book and we're putting our analysis together. And there's 10 such cases, um, eight of which in some way advance women's autonomy, um, even though it might be to a very small extent. Um, and we see that in the majority of these, of, of these cases, Clarence Thomas, um, voted on the side of um, against women's autonomy, I would say, right? To constrain women's autonomy or not to advance it, um, either by his um, decision in the two cases um, constraining women's rights, by his vote or by his, uh, he, he offers dissents in um, four of these cases. So uh, again, there's lots to dig into there, um, but this is just an example. Uh, we look at some other types of law and policies that, um, advance or constrain women's rights in the book, but this is just one table, this is just part of one table that uh, shows this. So next slide, please. So moving very quickly, uh, this is a lot, but hopefully I can hear from you what you would like to know more about, and maybe I can explain more and better um, some things as we have a chance to be in dialogue. Um, the woman in this picture is Allie Cole. She started an organization called the Purple Campaign, uh, which um, is focused on um, addressing the problem of sexual harassment in the workplace, whether that workplace is Congress, which is where she started her campaign um, to um, mitigate sexual harassment in the congressional realm. And um, she herself, um, so she, Allie is a Harvard Law School grad. I'm thrilled to say that she's now a member of our faculty, but when I met her and the reason I sought her out uh, was because of her work in the Me Too movement. Um, and she, uh, served as a board member for my Gender and Policy Center. Um, and now her director of policy has taken that role and Allie is, um, is a faculty member. So in any event, um, Allie had been a congressional intern as an 18 year old and had experienced um, unwanted touching by a, um, um, a representative uh, who had a reputation for being handsy, as she likes to say. Um, people told her that and going into it, and she was like, I, I don't want to turn down the opportunity to have a paid internship. Um, I can handle myself. Um, and she was basically groped at a public campaign event. Um, and But that was just one little part of Ellie's story. Uh, she went on to go to Harvard Law School. Um, she then graduated and got um, a job at a prestigious law firm, which turned out to be the firm uh, that was defending Harvey Weinstein. And she was even it accepted that to the extent that, you know, everybody needs a hear, uh, you know, everyone deserves to be represented um, and, and deserves a hearing and all of that. But she then subsequently found out that that law firm was employing former Israeli intelligence uh, folks to basically intercept women who who were accusers of Weinstein um, and um, 
try to get try to hear what their stories were. These people posed as um, advocates for women, and um, anyway, we're, we're manipulating the process in this kind of nefarious way. And it was at that point that she decided to leave the firm and um, start the Purple Campaign. And um, also in the course of this, she was one of the Me Too people. She was quoted in a Washington Post article relating her story about having been um, uh, groped as, a, as an intern herself. So, I mean, she kind of figures into this story in numerous ways. Um, but what I can say is that the, the CAA, the Congressional Accountability Act, Ali identified a mechanism of policy that could be used as an instrument to address the problem of sexual harassment in Congress. So um, she went on a campaign among congressional staffers um, to take action and, you know, was able to effectuate change similar to the type of change that the other women leaders that I um, showed you had been able to achieve in the campus context. So um, next slide, please. One of the charts we have in the book, some of the data that we brought to the fore was just that prior to the change that was achieved, partly thanks to Ali's efforts in the um, reform of the Congressional Accountability Act, was to not allow members of Congress to use public funds in, to pay off their sexual harassment or discrimination claims against them. Um, and if you, you see here, um, the amounts of those claims uh, um, paid per year, the amounts of the settlements um, to a, a total over this time period from 1997 to 2019 of $18 million. Next slide, please. And uh, now uh, this is Ali uh, again. And in this case on the left side, she is um, testifying uh, pretty recently. I think it was it was within the last six months or so. Um, they're now working on a judicial accountability act for staffers in, of the judiciary to also um, have their rights better addressed um, when cases of sexual harassment or assault come up. Because you know the ultimate power position really is a judge or um, a member of Congress, and it's very hard for women to to be. Uh, believed when they speak up. Um, they can also worry about losing their livelihoods, losing their jobs. Um, so this is the work of the Purple Campaign. And now uh, Ali has moved on to the judiciary um, to try to uh, bring about change there. Next slide, please. So uh, without, if women are not able to sort of make salaries commensurate with men or hold positions of power commensurate with men, we're, it's going to be very hard to rewrite this narrative. So we want to look to the mechanisms of laws and policy to mitigate the problems that we observe and to make it so that women are less silenced and more um, at the table um, when these decisions get made uh, so that we can have more just and equitable outcomes. Next slide, please. And this is, um, you know, I end the book with this quote from Alyssa Milano because she was the person who started the Me Too movement uh, with this tweet. I mean, the Me Too movement, as we know it, actually the hashtag um, uh, Me Too had been used by activist Tarana Burke um, back in 2006. But on Twitter as a platform, Alyssa Milano um, said, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, um, write Me Too as a reply to this tweet, and it just exploded. And, um, you know, she says women standing up and using their voices, standing up for each other in solidarity, the collective pain we felt has turned into a collective power. Um, and that's kind of the arc of, of the book, looking at this in these venues of power. Um, and next slide, please. And I think it's the last one. <laughs> so um, the, the aspiration of this project is to advance understanding of the problems as they exist, because there's a lot of pushback and denial and disbelief about the really egregious extent of these problems. Um, but also, more importantly, again, being with a policy mindset, um, what do we do about it? And how do we alleviate these things through policy um, in that context, while also addressing them in the cultural context in which we all exist. So, so many different actors uh, that we chronicle their um, actions in the book, uh, policy entrepreneurs, analysts, advocates, politicians, bureaucrats who implement policies, um, all of them are part of the complex system that has 
brought us to where we are today, but can be used um, to effectuate change going forward so that women um, are less, um, are more represented in the public sphere um, and that uh, that we hope will be a means of, again, achieving justice and equity um, in, in a grander uh, scale. So I think that's my last slide and I'm uh, interested and anxious to hear um, what I can, you know, what questions I might be able to answer uh, for you. Wow, that was just a wonderful overview of your new book, Bonnie. Um, really interesting to, to hear about. And um, folks participating, you're welcome to post your questions in the Q&A and um, we'll bring them forward for, for some discussion. Um, so Bonnie, I was, I was curious, so you, you have this cataloging of all these tweets. Can you talk more about like, like how you sort through, because there were thousands of tweets to look through. Yeah, yeah, there, and yeah, many thousands. <laughs> so I have been, I have been reading them. So I had started this project when I was looking at the problem of campus sexual assault. And because this generation of activists that I was studying, um, some of whom, you know, or were, were on the slide, um, they, for their, for that generation, using social media as a way to get their message out, even though they each had a very small organization, they were each able to affect a fair amount of change and to reach large audiences through this platform. So it's a unique, it was historically a unique thing. So I started doing this with someone from the engineering school, um, where he would, we would identify certain themes and they developed an algorithm to try to determine the sentiment in the tweets. But ultimately, reading stories, I mean, uh, when I've read so much scholarly literature about how women are characterized when they're campaigning, women politicians, you know, that I kind of knew what to look for. And so there is there is a form of uh, research called grounded theory, where you just kind of read all the stuff and let the themes emerge. And that's kind of what we did. Reading them, I would say, wow, all these words really mean crazy, like, you know, wacky, know nothing, you know, airhead, you know, you can just read through the list. So I just started making notes about them and collecting words. And in some ways it was amusing and in other ways it was horrifying. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, the word play is interesting, um, but, you know, also the implications are very disturbing. Okay, sure, I'm sure. Um, so can you talk a little bit, um, this is a question that came in about um, how the media can report on what's happening without reiterating the negative language. I mean, it, the, to show the tweet is just promulgating its distribution. Right. What could be done about that? Well, I think that one of the reasons they use the tweet is because it's splashy, right? It, it, it's people's reaction. Like sometimes when we hear things like this, you can't help but laugh, like whether nervously, you know, you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe somebody said that. So it, it, it's sort of hard not to, but there's um, a linguist, George Lakoff, who writes about political writing. And he says, um, you know, uh, don't, if you don't want to talk about the elephant, don't mention the elephant, right? Like, you know, it's, it's very hard. Once, once somebody says it, you can't not see it, right? Or, or it just looms large. But really calling, you know, somebody wacky and do nothing or, you know, really just using the words and putting that in print connects those two things very powerfully in people's minds. So whether you know if it's if it's denigrating their um, intelligence in all the many ways, or if it's talking mostly about their appearance, um, it it just solidifies that link. Um, so not doing that would be a good idea, but it would probably sell less papers, or you know it would it probably get less ratings on the Today Show, um, you know, and that's a problem that I don't really know the answer to, except that it's not really responsible journalism when people don't speak back to it. Um, and it, there are some other more subtle ways of using language in the case of sexual assault, for instance, where blame is attributed to the victim. And uh, there have been studies about this that also in part with uh, that came up in a literature review um, uh, with some of my co-authors when they use the passive voice to say, uh, you know, this woman was sexually assaulted. So it doesn't say this man assaulted a woman. Right. It, it, it kind of. And what we learn is that when passive voice is used in that way, that the verb is the responsibility for the verb is attributed to the named um, 
person. So it's the victim, right? It's like she was raped. She was assaulted. Well, what's wrong with her? Why'd she do that? <laughs> you know, right. like, and, and, you know, it's not just like, I I'm thinking these things it's, you know, studies really bear this out. So one would hope that responsible journalists would think about how they phrase things. Like even I was looking at the coverage of um, Nancy Pelosi's husband being under attack. And it was like, he was subject to blows from a hammer, which is like, how about somebody hit him with a hammer, right? You know, that it, it's really weird and troubling when people, it, it changes how you see things depending on how the headline is used. Really important point for us as we take in the news. Could you talk about um, this question, talk about a specific, an example of a specific policy change that happened on a campus that creates some more just outcomes in sexual assault cases? Are there any, is there any yeah, uh, you know, positive is, action yeah. that can be taken? We talk about that in the book and that was, so during the Obama administration, it was recognized that campus sexual assault was a very pervasive problem that had long been undiscussed, right? It's sort of the, the, the dirty little secret, right? That, and of course, universities don't want to talk about it because it tarnishes their brand. Um, and it, so it, it became um, recognized. And actually, Joe Biden um, gets credit for bringing this topic up. And one of the organizations that I mentioned, It's On Us, was part of the Obama administration. Um, and Joe Biden was a very strong advocate for um, addressing violence against women as a problem, and it, particularly in the campus context. So at the time, what they did was they changed the, uh, they, it's really hard to get, the language is very specific, but this very legalistic language was, um, so the Department of Justice office offers interpretations of the law that they put out to campuses that in these dear colleague letters, which basically give universities guidelines how to um, use the Title IX policy. And they made it easier for women to report, basically, is the upshot of this. So the wording of that made it easier for women to report. Um, and that was considered progress. When, when Trump came into office, his, um, you may remember Betsy DeVos was his secretary of education, and they very strongly felt that the biggest problem on campus was not um, the sexual assault, but the false accusations of sexual assault. And um, I write extensively in the book about, you know, in policy, we should be worried about the preponderance of evidence and false claims absolutely do occur. And that's reprehensible as well. But the number of those happening is on the order of in the thousands over a period of years and the sexual assaults um, in the millions. Um, and so to identify as the bigger problem, um, that is is disingenuous at best and damaging and so the the policy was switched under the trump administration to go back to um and and uh what it was prior to the obama administration and uh you know to, to bad effect for victims on campuses so, um, we're curious if um gmu has changed their policies in the way it, how it responds to sexual assaults and discrimination on campus. Um, as a result of having professors like you um, teaching about this and raising awareness. Well, I mean, I, that we like to hope <laughs> that, we, that we make a difference, but what I will say is every campus is required by law to, in, you know, institute the Title IX, you know, regulations and, um, so I do think it matters. I will say, I do think George Mason has done a relatively good job compared to most campuses. One of the exercises I used to do in class um, back, um, this is before the Trump administration even, but um, I would ask students because there's a law called the Cleary Act, which requires campuses to report on crimes committed on campus. And it was precipitated by the rape and murder of a young woman on campus. And her parents really became advocates for this law, which I think it was in the early 90s that it was instituted. But what we find is that campuses don't seem to, if you look at what's reported, you'll see that the number of sexual assaults on campuses, regardless of their size, is usually like four. 
And we just know that this is not true, right? Like you, you know that the problem is way bigger. Now, exact numbers, we don't know, but we have a sense of the order of magnitude. And it's it's something around 20 to 25% of the student population. So um, it's not four, <laughs> you know? Um, when I used to have students do that, I because I teach graduate students, I would say, ask your, go to your website for your undergraduate institution and see if you can find this data, which is required by law to be reported. And it's actually, my point was that it's actually very hard to find. So even though it's meant to be a mechanism mechanism of transparency, it's actually kind of a me measure, right? Like it doesn't really inform the marketplace, if you will, um, because that information gets suppressed. But at the time, I wanted to say that Mason had more reported than other schools. And that's actually a good sign because to the extent that people feel comfortable, it was still a unrealistically low number, but way bigger than um, actually more elite campuses tend to have less reporting, um, more hierarchical organizations tend to have less reporting, you know, so um, I, I would say it's to Mason's credit that they made people feel sufficiently comfortable relative to other campuses that we were getting reporting done. Somebody asked, does your book talk about sexual assault in the military? Is that an area you're looking at? I have looked at and thought about that, but not really in the book. I'm trying to think if I mentioned it at all, but the problem in the military is completely analogous to what we observe on campus. And any, so the playbook that you see is that in any organization, period, but in any organization particularly that observes strict hierarchies, you're, you're likely to see um, an exacerbated problem because what you have are people who have um, chain of command power um, that, to damage or destroy others' careers. And you have policy mechanisms that subvert any kind of system of justice. So in the military, what was happening was that someone could be found um, guilty of sexual assault, but the commanding officer could overturn the decision. Um, and that has been changed. Um, but you'll see similarly, and right now in academia, um, the economics field is going through its own Me Too movement, and it's really still roiling. Um, but again, if someone is a professor or a department chair or has a position of power, people who are students or even junior faculty can't really, this is a nationwide issue, can't really um, successfully speak up without damage to their reputation or careers. So the military is a really... Uh, interesting and important facet of this. And um, we have a, an event called, called Academy with a group called Academy Women. Um, and yeah, so it, I, I'm available to talk more about that, but it's not really in the book, although it, it follows the playbook of all these venues. Um, the question that's come in, um, uh, Cindy says, Dr. Stabile, a great presentation. And um, it, looking at in your research on disparaging language, were you able to assess any, assess gender to any extent? Um, and it appears to her that increasingly women are using this terminology against one another. Um, so can you comment on that and whether you view that as having a more or less impact? Um, so yeah, I mean, what one of the things that Kate Mann talks about in her book is that misogyny is enacted not only by men, but women who uphold, I mean, to use a, a women's studies term, the patriarchy, right? So, but to the extent that people uphold existing institutions of power, and oftentimes women can be gatekeepers for other women's behavior, women that are, um, that prefer or believe strongly that women should be in traditional roles, will really enact punishment, verbal or otherwise, on women who don't adhere to those strictures. So it's not to say that, um, you know, I, I used the term toxic masculinity when I was explaining something to a colleague of mine the other day, and he was like, Bonnie, you know, I've met some women who are real jerks. And I was like, me too, but that's not, that's not the point. This is a specific thing, right? <laughs> And the difference, the, the difference is in impact, um, who's affected. But it is true, and I think it's a good point that both men and women can can use this language to um, discredit women who are seeking positions of power or authority. And that because that really subverts historical power systems as we've lived them. 
So somebody has asked if the Biden administration has reversed um, some of the um, what Trump and DeVos has done have done. Yes, and as far as I know, I'm going to know more about that after next week because I'm going to be immersed with the women from these organizations. But what I will say is that the policy back uh, whiplash is really difficult for people like them to deal with. So you have people on campuses and they're like, wait, this is the policy. No, that's the policy. <laughs> oh, no, now it's this. Oh, and by the way, it's also during a pandemic where, you know, people coming back to campus. So it's hard to know which end is up. But yes, the um, the Biden administration has um, moved to um, address that. But some things, so in the Obama administration, the things were put in as recommendations using a dear colleague letter the mechanisms that the Trump administration used were more formal and less easy to change. They knew that they were, right? So you also have to be careful about what mechanisms we have and how strong they are. So they were wise from their perspective, wanting to set back these rights. They did it in a way that is a little more difficult to overcome, but um, you know, that, so yes, they, there's been movement, you know, movement back or forward, however you look at it. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so is there something um, that was really surprising in your research, something that you just kind of blew you away when you were collecting all this data? Um, actually, every day I am surprised by the pervasiveness of these problems and the denial and the inability to address them. The, so I guess it's not really what you're asking. It's the whole thing altogether. I can't get my head around. Um, you know, I, obviously I've immersed myself in the study of it and still you'd think I would know better, but I'm like, damn, I can't believe that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and I would say now, you know, there has been some backlash to the Me Too movement and to, you know, so um, I don't know where it's going. That is surprising to me. I mean, what's surprising to me is I went to a women's college in the mid eighties. Um, and then we were like, I'm going, everything's getting better. And like, women are just going to have equal opportunity. And, you know, my daughter, um, uh, who is a lawyer now, and uh, I guess she's 28 years old, but when she was in college, she would tell me, oh, somebody in my class said, I don't mind if I don't make as much as long as somebody holds the door open for me. And I, that is surprising to me. I just thought, oh, no, <laughs> it's surprising to me that the same issues are still ongoing and even worse in many cases, um, despite the fact that I acknowledge that we are privileged. A lot of times I'll get the response kind of like, you're a professor, your daughter's a lawyer, like it's a great world, like the, it's a great country. Agreed. But like, really? You know, we, it doesn't mean these problems are gone or that they're even substantially addressed. And that you know, it's Halloween, the undead nature. It's like a zombie problem <laughs> of this. We just can't kill it. You know, um, that just surprises me. Um, well, and it just, uh, somebody commented, it, this is, this goes back centuries. I mean, this is just, it's so long within our history. And um, that's why it's just so challenging to overcome. But it's, it is shocking how it's come up so much in the past in such recent history. Are there are there countries, other countries that have had policies that are more supportive of women that the United States could emulate? I think there are, but I don't really study them. I'm kind of generally aware that there so there are some that actively work towards more proportional representation in the political sphere. Um, and there can be discomfort with that, right? Setting quotas so-called or, um, but there are certainly other countries that have a better track record of women in positions of power um, and of less virulent um, gender disparagement, right? Um, I mean, one thinks of the Scandinavian countries, for instance, where there's just a lot more gender equity. But so some of the policies that I think go along with this less explicitly have to do with are there laws that um, that promote fair pay or that require right fair pay um, that provide maternity leave um, that provide leave for caretaking you know those uh, that provide support for education all of those things support women's ability to 
um, achieve and maintain those those roles. And to the extent that we don't have those, like th that leads to um, less gender equity, I would say. Well, and I think um, Eileen just uh, commented that it was easier to recognize second class status when you couldn't get a loan or couldn't get a credit card or couldn't rent a car. And we fix some of that, mm -hmm. um, but it's the underlying attitudes that are just so much harder to address. Yes, and I, I definitely want to acknowledge and celebrate advancements. Um, I, I think that I have I hear my my mentor Sue Tolchin, who was my dissertation chair, talked about when she was I guess in the seventies when she was a, a younger professor. Uh, was in, invited to the Cosmos Club, but she wasn't allowed to walk in the front door because women weren't allowed to go in the front door. Women weren't allowed to be members. So, you know, you think, wow, that's really not that long ago. So that's a good thing that we're beyond that. But then when we see the, the pushback, you know, the virulent pushback and disparagement, and now we face, you know, the, the Dobbs decision, you know, if I'm thinking about laws that advance or constrain women's autonomy, um, if women don't have reproductive autonomy, that is going to be a huge setback um, for their ability to uh, work outside the home um, and advance in other ways. So, and then this becomes a, a vicious cycle, right? Where if they're not there at the table to make the decisions, then um, these decisions will uh, get, you know, get made without them in ways that don't, in many ways, don't advance their interests. As somebody commented that there there may be countries that are better with gender equity, but there are cultures that may be better um, and uh, cultures that are matriarchal, perhaps. Um, yeah, I, I don't even know. I, I'm, I shouldn't say I'm hoping for a matriarchy, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> moving in that direction. But no, I, I, I'm just going for equity. <laughs> yes, but, right. But I right. will say that... Um, there are different cultures and there have been, this has been studied. So there, um, there's a book that we uh, used to look at that looked at, they basically interviewed IBM executives globally and, to, and, it, and it, they talked about power distance, right? From um, hierarchical organizations, but certainly there are places where um, there's less virulent separations with gender roles and um, more equitable outcomes. And yeah, so that's a whole thing that people have studied and we kind of know where it's working and it's hard to know. Culture is hard to change. As you said, we this is all of history that women have been sort of seen in a certain light. So to change it within even a century would be a lot. And we have made great strides, but I think it's important to me as a matter of justice and fairness to always continue to um, to, to move the needle to until we get some of that more equitable space, um, you know, to leave no one behind and to uh, to advance those causes. So I'm curious, um, with with Twitter and sort of the bullying that happens on Twitter, um, do you have it? Um, have you had to deal with any um, response any responses to anything like that? Or you have a prov provocative title for your book and. Um, have you been targeted at all or do you, do, are you prepared for any kind of response to things like that? I mean, I, I have, you know, knock on wood, mercifully not been very targeted. Mm -hmm. I know people who have. Um, I, um, I've had a few messages that are, can be disturbing on social media, but it's been for me a relative rarity. I did have some concerns writing this book and I do have some concerns writing and talking about the things that I do that I could be subject to that. I will say that um, I really do try to, and I know this won't help because rape, you know, culture is in my title, you know, so, but um, I, I really try to be as analytical as possible. So I try to, I try to marshal evidence for what the state of these things is, right? So how pervasive is sexual assault on campus or how many, how much money did we spend on, from the public coffers on congressional um, harassment cases, you know, to the extent that we can, this is what researchers can do. I think we have limited influence, but, you know, that we can provide a base of, you know, solid information. And then we have to hope that people will use that information. But when we do policy analysis, we have to do problem definition. And that requires the bringing together of data and information. And then we have to think, 
analytically about what would be some structured responses. What are the mechanisms in policy and law that can get us to where we need to go? So I, I try as much as I can, although my hair is on fire half the time, uh, to stick to those tools that I learned in my, you know, in my education, in my doctoral research. So um, somebody asked, uh, what actions can we take daily to support women's empowerment and, and change this rape culture? I think um, that's a great question. And I think that people can sort of call it out when they see it, when um, even, you know, even the little things about, in the book I talk about, even something as small that's part of this about the idea that women are bad drivers. There's a lot of jokes about women not being good at stuff, even in simple ways like that, like not laughing at those jokes, right? That, um, and understanding what it means. Those types of jokes are disempowering because they cut at women when they attempt to exercise their autonomy. So if you live in most places in the United States, you really need a car, right? You know, so if you think about what, what does the, um, what's the meaning behind these things? If you see in a meeting or if you see that harassing behavior to be an ally to that person, to call it out, um, if you have the ability to influence through your writing, um, or you're speaking, you know, to sort of think critically about how am I discussing these topics? Um, you know, that's, I think those things are helpful. All of us can only do very little, but collectively, I think we can do a lot. And I think awareness is really a really good first step or, and educating yourself, continuing to educate yourself to read and think about this. Um, and it's very disturbing, actually. It's not a fun space to be in, but to acknowledge while considering your mental health, right? <laughs> Is, is the best we can do. I want to share that uh, Dr. Stabil has shared a discount code if you want to purchase the book. Um, it just came out, I think, or is just it's out, off, yeah, off the press. And there's a link in the chat um, to the publisher website, and there's a discount code there. So um, and if you don't see it in the chat, you're welcome to email us uh, at info at encorelearning.net and we'll share that with you. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, and what's what's your next book? What's your what's your other um, topic areas that you want to address? Oh, gosh, I, I don't know about a book, but I can say that uh, coming up from the Gender and Policy Center, there are two areas that we're studying right now. Um, one of them is uh, representation in public administration programs. So that's what I teach in. But we're looking at um, how public administration is taught. And since we're interested in equitable outcomes when public administration functions are carried out, and that can be emergency management and the like, everything that involves an interface between citizens and government. Um, so we're looking at how public administration is taught. So we're looking at um, introductory and capstone classes to see who teaches the classes, whose work is represented in the classes, like the readings, um, and what topics are addressed. So are people made aware of these things? So that's kind of a public affairs education type of thing. Um, and another topic is, um, is actually menstrual equity, which um, this idea, you know, that people have talked about the tampon taxes and stuff. Um, again, this is another topic that I really didn't want to get into because I just thought, oh, it goes, you know, oh boy, I'm on everybody's last nerve and now I'm going to start talking about periods. Like I just, <laughs> I was like, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. But I had an undergraduate student who took on this topic. And actually, again, these young um, students are just amazing. Um, she was part of a campaign to have free menstrual products put on campuses. Because again, if women don't have access, and for some, this is really an issue. So the research shows that there are a significant number of people for whom the ability to afford such products um, is a problem. And then that can prevent them from going to work or going to school. And so um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a problem and it's been dealt with at um, various state legislatures. And apparently uh, Virginia, I've been told, has a dream team of, um, of lawmakers who have studied, who have worked on this issue. And um, I plan to interview them and have a panel with them um, next semester. So we have lots of different topics, but those are two that I've worked with, with student groups on of late. You were shared that there were two uh, recent documentaries aired on PBS about discrimination against female scientists in Canada. Um, oh. And 
you could consider doing a documentary to promote your work. Oh yeah, that's a yeah. that's a good idea. Actually, that that was a great. I think if you're talking about the picture a scientist um, documentary, which was so great because it really did show it's this idea, you know. And this is this is part of the problem that we all face, right? If you close your eyes and picture picture a professor, uh, picture a congressperson, um, picture a firefighter, what do you see? You know, and it's usually not someone that looks like me. You know, <laughs> it's and and it's just because that's what we you know, that's been around as, so talking about that, thinking about it, you know, acknowledging we all have our own biases. Um, so I think, and I like the idea of doing a documentary or like any way that you can get the word out is helpful, right? So a book like mine, every not everybody's going to pick it up and read it. Um, but, you know, a documentary, reaching people where they are uh, is, a, is a great idea to, to look at all different venues. Well, reaching people where they are, the um, what doesn't law and order, special victims unit bring about a bunch of issues around? Actually, it has harassment. precipitated. Yeah. yeah, I think that yeah. they, um, so that was, they, um, Marissa, I don't know how you say her name, Mariska Haggerty or Haggerty, whatever her name is. <laughs> um, she's an activist and um, they, uh, because she learned about these issues w while making that show, which I, I don't think I've ever seen. I used to watch Law and Order back before there were other subsets of it. But um, yeah, the, the fact that rape kits don't get tested and a lot of them get thrown out and, you know, the evidence is never used um, seems like, a, you know, so there's the collection of, of stuff from rape kits, but the fact that they're not used is really, you know, and and she she brought to light the pervasiveness of that problem, and um, is trying to, uh, and has been effective in in addressing it. And you see uh, in the news every once in a while they'll say, oh, they finally tested this kit ten years later, and now they see that there's a serial rapist in California or whatever. So you know, but again, these are not these issues aren't top of mind. Uh, you know, women haven't women's issues, so to speak, haven't always gotten, you know, been top of mind for um, lawmakers. And also people in cities or on campuses, there's a lot of denial about these problems. You know, people don't want to talk about them because they don't want to acknowledge they exist. Um, and then um, people feel a lot of shame and um, uh, there's a lot of stigma surrounding them, which is another reason that people stay silent and that these things, you know, like fester in the darkness, you know, so if we don't deal with them, um, then the problems will be perpetuated. That's right. That's right. Well, I want to thank you so much. This has been just a really wonderful dialogue and great to hear about your new book. Well, and, thank you so much for having me. It was really uh, great to talk with you and I'm happy um, to, my email is bstable at gmu.edu. So if anybody uh, wants to reach out, um, I I'd be happy to hear from you. And we hope next semester we'll have some um, events at the Gender Policy Center at Mason. So I um, hope you'll look for those and um, that we can continue being in dialogue. Great. And if you want to put together a, a class and have more dialogue on this, we'd be happy to entertain that too. Great. Super. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Know that when the um, webinar ends, you'll be prompted to complete a feedback survey. That's helpful for us. So please do that. And we'll see you at our next event when you can learn about the backstory of Casablanca. Um, so thanks. Happy Halloween, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.